Good morning. Glad to see you all as we prepare to worship our Lord and Savior on this fine Sunday morning. Uh, I want to invite you to pull out your In the Life of the Church insert while you, so that I can point you to a couple of things coming up in the life of the church while you're doing that. Welcome to all of you who are joining us on Facebook. We are really glad that you were here with us this morning as well and hope you're being blessed wherever you are. And um, just as a reminder for those of you who are email active, one of the best ways to stay informed about what's going on, sign up for our weekly email. It comes out every Friday just uh, with a little bit of information about worship, a couple of things happening in the life of the church, and a way we invite you to serve the world through service or mission. And uh, you can sign up. There's the, the, the QR code on the back of the worship bulletin. You can scan that or go to our webpage. Those of you who are joining us online, if you want to get our Friday email, just go to our webpage and you'll see the bar up at the top of the screen. Sign up for our email and you can get it every week. It's a great way to stay informed. Okay, a couple of things just to point you to. First on the, the front page, you'll see August 27th, we're going to have one worship service. We're coming to uh, our homecoming worship service. We're going to have the Reverend Dr. Tom Sweets back with us. He retired a couple of years ago, but he is not a retiring man. He is back, and he'll be with us on August 27th at 10 o'clock. And then as a part of that, we will have, after the worship service, we'll have a ministry fair, some opportunities to see some of the different ministries that we have going on that you can be involved with. So some ways that you can participate in the life of the church. And then uh, uh, following that, we'll have a lunch down in the fellowship hall. And this is a great opportunity, uh, if you haven't seen it yet, a great opportunity to see w the work that has been done in our kitchen refresh. Missy Hardy assembled a cast of thousands and a team of some great volunteers to do a refresh of our kitchen and this is a great opportunity for you to see the, the work that that team has, has done. It, um, you will be pleased, I, I, I believe. So mark that down for August 27th, 10 o'clock worship, um, ministry fair, and lunch afterward. Uh, if you take a look inside the In the Life of the Church, uh, coming up this week, uh, you may have seen my letter in the church newsletter that our church administrator, Donna Schoonmaker is uh, going to be leaving us. She's going to be going to a church closer to her home. She lives up in Dayton, and she's needing to spend some time caring for her mom. And so this is going to work out a lot better for her. It's going to be a little more challenging for us. But uh, she will be um, with us on Monday and Wednesday of this week. And Wednesday, we have an opportunity uh, between 11.30 and 1.30 for us to, if you haven't had a chance to say farewell to Donna, drop in any time during that time frame. You can wish her well, bring her flowers, cards, tokens of appreciation, whatever the Lord leads you to. But that would be a great opportunity to, to say goodbye to Donna and wish her well. She has been a terrific part of, of our team. I think I speak for all the staff when we say we have just been so blessed to work with her. She is a wonderful woman of God. We're going to miss her a lot, but we wish her well. And then um, the announcement right under that, our worship arts team is going to be doing a spruce up of the sanctuary heading into the fall. So they are assembling the altar angels. So if you'd like to be a part, if you feel called to be a part of the altar angels team on Saturday at 930 in the morning, we're going to be doing a little bit of a spruce up, a little refresh of the sanctuary in here. Just, you know, a few things like dusting, sweeping, clean, just getting ready for the homecoming Sunday and the fall. So if you feel called to do that, Mary Beth would love to talk with you. She's back there behind the piano, and uh, you can bend her ear about that again this Saturday at 9.30. All the rest you can take a look at at your leisure. But brothers and sisters, we're here to worship. We're here to turn our hearts and minds once again to Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith, to, to bask in the goodness and the graciousness and then the grandeur and the glory of our Lord. And so I'm going to invite you to prepare your hearts to worship the Lord by joining our, our voices together and standing as you are able for our opening hymn, hymn number 341, Jesus Shall Reign. Let's stand and sing.
You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, let us pray. Mighty God, you are the creator and maker and sustainer of all things. We gather together to bask in awe and reverence and wonder at your goodness, at your glory, at your grace. Lord, we pray that as we gather together in worship today that you would strike us deeply with a sense of your wonders. Strike us deeply with a, a renewed reverence, with a renewed hunger and thirst for your power and your presence in our lives. Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would move in us today and that you would draw us ever closer to you. Lord, we pray that you would be honored and glorified in our midst. And to that end, we join our voices together, praying the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. As we come before the Lord, we are aware of our need of grace, our need of forgiveness, our need of God's power in our lives. And so I invite you now to join your voices together on this corporate prayer of confession. But again, as always, let these words reflect the sincerity of our hearts to draw close to the Lord. Let us pray. God of our salvation, we confess the sins of our hearts, minds, and souls and ask for your forgiveness. Keep our conduct blameless. Keep our hearts watchful in holiness and bring to perfection the good you have begun in us. We ask this through your Son and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, my friends, know this, that through the grace and the mercy of Jesus, all your sins are forgiven, all your sins are washed away, and that you are adopted as beloved sons and daughters of the living God. Hear now these words of assurance that uh, Paul writes for us in the book of Romans, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. Through Jesus Christ, you have been set free from the law of sin and death. You are redeemed, you are adopted, you are beloved, and you are God's precious children through the grace of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, this is the good news. Thanks be to God. seated. One of the neat ministries that Missy instituted last year is the Backpack Blessing, where we pray for everyone going back to school this year. So I'm going to invite Missy Hardy, our Director of Family Ministries, to come up and lead us in this year's Backpack Blessing. Most of our families with younger kids come to the earlier service, and we had um, anybody going back to school come up front at this service, I'd like, as, as we go through this prayer, I'd like anybody who is described to stand at, in place and Crystal will come um, greet you with a token of remembrance. Mighty God, you are God the Father who creates all truth, beauty, and goodness. 
You are Christ the Son who renews our hearts and leads us to abundant life. You are the Holy Spirit who teaches us all things and empowers us in our calling. You appointed times and seasons for everything, and you have made everything beautiful in its time. We gather at the start of this school year, asking for your blessing upon this new season of life. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for teachers. Any teachers stand up now. We pray for teachers. May you work powerfully through them to nurture a love of learning. May they be your instruments of truth. Lord, bless our teachers. We pray for administrators. Guide them with wisdom as they provide the vision and path for the year. May they be great stewards of all you have provided. Lord, bless our administrators. We pray for adults who work with students beyond the classroom. May they be your instruments of hope, imagination, and inspiration. Lord, bless our program staff. We pray for the staff who work behind the scenes to provide safe, clean, and healthful spaces. May they be your instruments of promoting well-being for all. Lord, bless our support staff. We pray for parents. Empower them with the words and encouragement they will need to help their children greet the school year with excitement and confidence. Lord, bless families of students. We pray for students. May they feel the love of all those who have been called to teach, administer, and serve as program and support staff. May they be open to receive your lessons about truth, goodness, and beauty. May they grow to be wise and strong and kind and good. Lord, bless our students. May you give all who are returning to school strength and courage. May they remember that wherever they go, you go with them. As everyone fulfills your calling for their lives, may they feel your pleasure in their efforts and rejoice in your glory. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Missy. And if folks uh, who are going back to school, if you did not get your keychain token, they, they are available um, back in the entry foyer. Crystal is walking around with them right now. I'm going to invite you now um, because we've prayed blessing for all of our teachers and students, but you are also instruments of God's blessing to one another. And so I'm going to invite you to Stand and extend the peace of Christ to one of one another, and uh, the peace of Christ be and abide with you all now and forevermore. Did I turn this off? Ah. And while we all settle down, down here in the sanctuary, all of us who are here in the sanctuary extend to all of you who are joining us online the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen. We come now to the time of the service where we are receiving tithes and offerings. As always, I invite you to ponder and consider how is the Lord calling you and to be working through you as his instrument of blessing all throughout this week. Let's return the tithe and the offering.
Let us pray. Lord, we return these tithes and these offerings unto you. And we also offer our very selves. We offer the strength of our hands. We offer the moment of our days. We offer the intentions of our hearts. We offer the thoughts of our mind. We offer it all unto you, Lord. We pray that you would make use of us as your instruments. Help us to be instruments of praise. Help us to be instruments of proclamation. Help us to be instruments of grace and blessing and comfort and peace. Lord, into your hands we commit our spirits, we commit these tithes and offerings, and we commit our prayers, all for the glory of Christ. Amen. And brothers and sisters, while the deacons are returning the offering back to the back, our next hymn is an in, or it's on the back of the order of worship, the spacious firm, firmament on high. So I'll invite you to turn to the back of the order of worship and join our voices together on this hymn.
may be seated. Our scripture reading is Psalm 19. And if you looked at the source for the words to that hymn, it was also Psalm 19. I just happened to see that. But a psalm, this is a psalm that David wrote and where he relates how he and God's creation actually stand in awe of their creator and they hallow his name. So listen to the word of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet, their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from sinful, willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of the Lord. And may God add his blessing to the reading and to the proclamation of his word. Amen. So we are in the starting messages of our series on how to talk with God, which, again, I'm framing this about prayer, but understanding prayer as ongoing conversation with God, ongoing talking and listening to God. And, and, and I'm trying to frame this, we're, we're, we're framing this around the Lord's Prayer and working with the Lord's Prayer as a daily ongoing discipline. Uh, so, so finding those quiet times in your day, those down times, or those moments when perhaps you're internally agitated and using that as a springboard to go to the Lord's Prayer, but to go to the Lord's Prayer in talking with God and how to connect to God and how to listen to God. So taking that downtime while you're waiting for the coffee to brew or while you're in line at the store or while you're stuck in traffic and, and taking those moments and praying the prayer all throughout the day as a way to have your whole day as conversation with God. And you will remember, for those of you who have been with us, you'll remember that my challenge to you has been for you to actually practice this throughout the week. So I'm gonna ask, like I'm gonna be doing every week during this series, how you doing with that? How's it going? I eagerly look forward to hearing, somebody caught me after the last service and told me a story of her experience that I'll share um, in a future sermon. And I eagerly look forward to your stories of how you are experiencing God's presence and listening and talking with God as you work with the Lord's Prayer. So last week, we looked at the very beginning, our Father 
who art in heaven, hallowed be the... Well, actually, this week is hallowed be the name. <laughs> Last week was just our Father who art in heaven. And the idea of working with that to, to, to grasp that God tells us about our truest self, our identity as God's beloved children. Through the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, we receive this wonderful adoption by God. And we are adopted as beloved. All, all of our wrongdoing is washed away. We are beloved. We are told God cherishes us, delights in us. And, and we get this refreshed and renewed identity. And some of what we talked about last week was how that can be very helpful when we are feeling unseen, when we are feeling uh, disconnected, when, when we feel the sense of imposter syndrome or any of these other types of internal turmoil and churning that, that we may have and, and that potentially praying that prayer can be of great benefit to us. So this week, we come to Hallowed Be Thy Name. We'll talk a little bit about how, how praying that can, well, how I have found it helpful. Again, my main thing is to get you to be working with the, with the prayer God may use any of these phrases to connect with you in different ways. But I'm just going to share with you some of my experience. Uh, but, but one neat little thing there, I mean, hallowed be thy name. We could take the deep dive into talking about holiness, particularly the holiness of God. R.C. Sproul has a wonderful book on the holiness of God that takes us on a deep dive into the theology of that. And I do commend that book to you in this idea of God's majesty, power, transcendence, and, and that he, you know, he, he is holy other and set apart and, and therefore worthy of reverence and awe and wonder. And these are good theological truths. Um, but I'm going to be focusing on how do we pray this, hallowed be thy name. Similarly, we could talk a lot about the theology of the name of God. There's some rich stuff in there about how the name of God is God's uh, emblematic of God's creative power and God's divine rule in the universe, the extension of God's power into reality. Some wonderful theology that we could get to another time. But what we're focusing on today is how do we pray? When we pray, hallowed be thy name. What are we asking the Lord in our lives? Now, uh, it, a number of things, but what uh, what I experience as I pray hallowed be thy name tends to be a more personal experience of asking God, asking God to empower me to be more fascinated by his character. To be more fascinated by his character. And I find that Psalm 19 really helps me lean into this in a powerful way. So that's why we chose Psalm 19. Psalm 19 is quite lovely because it, it gets at two ways in which we know God. The theologians will talk about we know God through general revelation and we know God through special revelation. General revelation is how God reveals himself in his works of creation. You know, just like any given artist puts their thumbprint on anything that they create. You want to know something about Vincent van Gogh? You Go look at the paintings of Vincent van Gogh. It reflects something of his character. And you can learn something about van Gogh just through the work. In how much more, then, can we learn things through God's handiwork when God created everything? And the theologians call this general revelation. And the beginning of Psalm 19 gives us a really good picture of that. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. And, then, and David is using that. It's just emblematic that God's glory, God's goodness, some things about God's character are known in creation. And it's not just the heavens. You know, this is just emblematic of all of creation. The seas, the, 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 the creatures of the earth, all of them proclaiming God's goodness, proclaiming God's glory. We can learn things. We can experience some of that power and some of that, that um, goodness of God by observing his handiwork. And, and this is something um, that is known to Christians all throughout the centuries. You know, we think of Jonathan Edwards, the great theologian of the colonial era. He was a contemporary of Benjamin Franklin, and um, you know, 
everybody knows him for sinners in the hands of an angry God, and, you know, because that's what they put in the literature textbooks. But, but he was, had this expansive mind. He was fascinated by many different subjects, including the natural sciences. And, and he marveled at nature. And he, in his work, um, The Nature of True Virtue, he talks about how he's walking through the New England countryside and he sees baby spiders just floating on the wind. You know, the, what baby spiders will do is they'll put forth a filament of, of, of spider web and then they'll just be blown along on the winds to wherever the next place is. And, and he was just fascinated by that. And how, he thought how wonderful it is that God would allow even the smallest creatures the delights and joy of, of playing and dancing on the wind. And Jonathan Edwards wrote this, all the beauty to be found throughout the whole creation is but the reflection of the diffused beams of that being who hath an infinite fullness of brightness and glory, God. God is the foundation and the fountain of all being and beauty. Man, I wish I could write like that. That's just extraordinary. But just this, this insight that wherever we find beauty, true beauty, wherever we find truth, wherever we find goodness, that just reflects the character of the creator. Indeed, many of the great scientists understood this. Uh, I think of Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus, who developed the modern system of taxonomy. He was a, a biologist, and he was fascinated by you know, animals of all kinds. And so you know, this modern, we call it the Linnaean system, named after him. And, and he developed this system of, you remember it from, from school, or you see it down at the zoo, kingdom, phylum, order, genus, species, all of, all of that stuff of the way that we understand all biological life on Earth and categorizing that, that was developed by Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus was a devout believer, a devout Christian man. Do you know why he developed this classification system? So he could understand the mind of God. He understood that God's creation of all the creatures in the world, it reflects something of his character. And so we study it so we can grasp more of his character and more of his goodness. And it wasn't just Carl Linnaeus. We think about other great scientists. Gregor Mendel, maybe you remember him from a biology class where you studied genetics. He really pioneered the field of genetics. He was a monk. He was a monk who was interested in breeding peas. And he discovered this whole thing about genes and you know one the, the daddy pea and the mama pea both can contribute genes and and how that all works because he was trying to understand the mind of god or even more famously sir isaac newton founder of newtonian physics a whole branch of physics he has laws of physics named after him pretty smart amazing guy devout christian who wanted to understand the workings of the universe, he saw that the cosmos has order to it, orderliness. You know, it, and, and, you know, quantum physicists have discovered the order is a lot weirder than we ever thought. But, but still, that there was this orderliness to the universe. And he wanted to understand the mind of God in that. God's goodness and greatness is revealed in creation. And the theologians understand this as general revelation. Well, that's all good and well, Russell, but I thought you were going to tell me how to pray. Well, see, this is where, as we are going through the Lord's Prayer, as you are going through the Lord's Prayer on a daily basis, sometimes in those down moments, those quiet moments, as you're praying the Lord's Prayer, and coming to that hallowed be thy name, my experience is when I come to that hallowed be thy name, perhaps when I'm out taking a morning walk or an evening walk, hallowed be thy name, and it prompts me to be much more aware of the grandeur and the glory of God in the rabbits that are chewing up my neighbor's clover or the deer that are chewing up my neighbor's hostas. <sighs> to, to see God's glory in the sunset and the rolling hills and to just be awestruck and wonderstruck. Yes, hallowed be thy name. And to praise God and thank God for the goodness of his creation. Or, you know, we had the mission dinner last night, and 
Uh, as we were, uh, one of the things we talked about was the beauty of the mountains of Honduras. As I'm riding in the back of a truck, and we're riding on our way down to either a, a church worship service or other places, and we're looking out at the majestic mountains of Honduras. Hallowed be thy name. And having a renewed sense of awe and wonder at his glory, and his goodness, and his grace. Sometimes when praying the Lord's Prayer, that hallowed be thy name can take you by surprise. You know, I've, I have also found sometimes the mind is running and racing on the anxieties, on the, oh no, I got this. And Have you ever had it where you're like driving along and you think of a not so pleasant encounter with somebody and then you start thinking about, well, I'm going to see them again, and they're going to say this, and then I'm going to, and before you know it, you're having an almost argument with somebody who's not even sitting there in the car with you. Maybe I'm the only one who does that, but what I find is that, whoa, wait a minute, you know, my mind's going into a not a great place, Lord, <laughs> and, you know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Sometimes God will hang me up on that hallowed be thy name in the midst of one of those mind racing moments and just ah pause pause and know my grandeur pause and know my goodness pause and know that the universe is in my hands you don't have to have this argument russell with a figment in your car it can be useful in very many ways to prompt us back to seeing his goodness and his glory and his grandeur in creation i would even say that this is useful perhaps when you're going in to enjoy works of human art your concerts or going down to the art museum hallowed be thy name because God's glory is reflected through all truth and goodness and beauty and so in the music of a Franz Josef Haydn or in the artwork of a Van Gogh you can see something of God's glory hallowed be his name now the thing that's quite lovely about this you know, he talks about the heavens declare the glory of God, but then it reflects that human poetic piece. You know, they have no speech, they have no words. This beautiful poem, even reflecting on, on the, um, the, the sun, you know, it is like a bridegroom coming out of this chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens, makes its circuit to the other. You know, so once again, this just imaginative piece that prompts us to, to grasp that even in art, we can see God's glory. But now, take a look at verse 7, because this is where it turns. And, and to a degree, it feels like a non sequitur, right? We've been talking about the glory of creation and the goodness of creation, and then verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. And it goes through all these verses talking about the excellency of God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect. It refreshes the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. All these benefits and all these personal things that, that come to us from the law of the Lord, from the word of God, from the scriptures. And you see, that's where theologians, they talk about general revelation, God's revelation of himself in creation, but then they talk about special revelation. Special revelation is God speaking through the prophets. God speaking authoritatively through the prophets to give us truer, deeper insight into his character, into his will. And we see in Scripture, and here we see in David, he holds them both. Yes, general revelation, but God's special revelation, we learn more about his will, his design for us. We learn more about our identity in Christ. We learn so much more about his character. You can't discern the Trinity from the majesty of the sunsets, but you can discern the Trinity from the word of God. And when you discern the Trinity, then that just explodes a whole new level of richness, of understanding and appreciation of who God is. So the scriptures are living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, the, the author of Hebrews says. And here, this becomes this invitation to explore the scriptures, to read the scriptures, to go to the scriptures for insight, because you will know God better. You will know God more truly 
more deeply, more richly. I think part of the challenge is we oftentimes treat the scriptures like a little morning pill that we have to take. You know, I've got to do my morning devotional. All right, let me get the morning devotional done. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says. He who made you, who formed you in the womb, and will, will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Great, done. Thank you, Lord. Okay, I've got to get off and get my day started. Sometimes we kind of treat, I've got to get my daily Bible reading in, and we treat it like a morning pill that we've got to take. That's not how to approach the Scriptures. And again, this is where the Lord's Prayer helps. Hallowed be thy name. Approaching the scriptures not as a handy to-do list, not as this is seven habits for highly effective Christians, you just kind of internalize these nice principles for living, and you know, not as a rule book, though I mean it does contain some things we ought to do. This is a love letter, a love letter from God to his people. It's a very strong, uh, a very strange, long, sprawling love letter across genres written, to, written in different languages, 66 different books of different types. It's telling a grand, big, glorious story of God's love for his people. Beginning from before the foundation of time in the Trinitarian fellowship where the Father and the Son agree that they're going to create and the spirit agrees that creation will happen and that they will bless God's beloved people and then it plays out all throughout history and ends in the eager expectation of God wrapping everything up in a symphony of love of what is billed as the wedding feast of the Lamb and his church. It's a love letter, folks. Approach scripture that way and that when when I pray, hallowed be thy name, before I come to a study of God's word, that just slows me down. Listen. Listen, Russell, for the Holy Spirit. Approach God's word and listen for his word of grace, his word of tenderness, his word of challenge, his loving word to you. When I pray, hallowed be thy name, it makes me come to the scriptures understanding I'm not going to stay the same after this because it's an encounter with God, not a, just a text to be studied. And that's kind of where it goes in verses 12 and 13. Who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. It becomes this understanding that the encounter with God is transformative. Keep your servant from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Transform me, O oh God. Change me. Make me more Christ-like. Do something with me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. And then in that last verse, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be correct. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> It says, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. See where that goes? We know God so that we may please God, that God may be pleased in us and we may be pleased in him, that we may be enjoying rich relationship with the living God. And so we... We hunger and thirst to know more of God's character. And we know more of God's character through general revelation and through special revelation. And this prayer, hallowed be, my name, hallowed be thy name, not my name, <laughs> hallowed be thy name, becomes this invitation, this invitation to hunger and to thirst and to yearn for more knowledge, more experience, more fascination, more delight the character of the living God. So I ask you again, how are you doing with the prayer? As you work with the prayer throughout your days, perhaps, just perhaps, when you come across this phrase, God may be prompting you to a deeper encounter with his character this week. You think about that. 
and then please, please practice it. Amen. Let's join our voices on our closing hymn. I sing the almighty power of God. Let's stand as you are able and let's sing together. And now, my friends, go in grace, go in mercy, go in peace. May the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore. Amen.